Hello class, thank you all for joining me today. In this session, we are going to talk about proteins. Now, in the last two videos, we talked about two of the four uh, macromolecules. For those of you who remember, macromolecules are large molecules that perform certain functions in your body. Uh, the ones we talked about were carbohydrates and lipids. And now we're going to talk about the protein. Now, before we get into this, best to remind you about the terms we'll be using. For instance, we're going to be using the terms monomer and polymer a lot. Mon polymers are basically like chains that the uh, mac macromolecule are made out of. Protein is the poly poly po polymer, while monomers are like the chain links. Uh, for instance, if you recall, carbohydrate um, uh, monomer was the monosaccharide, or uh, saccharides, or um, the uh, simple sugar. And for lipids, it was the fatty acid. For proteins, we would discover that it's the amino acid that is the monomer. So now that we got out of the way, let's begin. Proteins are one of the most abundant or organic molecules in living systems and have the most diverse range of functions of all macromolecules. Proteins may be structural, regulatory, contractile, or protective. They may serve in transport, storage, or membranes, or they may be toxins or enzymes. Each cell in a living system may contain thousands of proteins, each with a unique function. Their structures, like the functions, vary greatly. They are all, however, amino acid polymers arranged in a linear sequence. And I think we would all be surprised on how many things we take for granted that are actually done by proteins. If you have a protein synthesis problem, you'd be surprised how many things can go wrong in your body. Now, there are numerous types of proteins, each with different functions, and here they are right now. Enzymes, which you've probably heard of, which living cells produce, are, catal are catalysts in biochemical reactions, such as digestion, and are usually complex or conjugate proteins. Uh, for those of you who may not remember um, chemistry, a catalyst is something that causes a reaction to happen. Um, I can't think of any right off the top of my head, but generally, if it looks like something is, if you have like two mixtures or something and nothing is happening, but then you drop something else in there, that was a catalyst. Actually, I learned, I believe, if uh, a lot of times you just put like a little metal thing, a little magnet thing in there, and that becomes a catalyst. Each enzyme is specific for the substrate, a reactant that binds to an enzyme, upon which it acts. The enzyme may help in breakdown, rearrangement, or synthesis reactions. We call enzymes that break down the substrates car catabolic enzymes. Those that build more complex molecules from their substrates are anabolic enzymes, and enzymes that affect the rate of reaction are catalytic enzymes. And we will discover, I don't think we'll learn in this section, if I recall my, my uh, schooling, we study it much later, but a lot of times enzymes are, can, can be done specifically for certain reactions, like there isn't a like a master key enzyme. Each enzyme does a certain function because each enzyme that attaches to a certain protein, a protein will have that little thing will have that little thing carved out for the enzymes, uh, for the enzymes, uh, what's it called protruding protein to lock into. Uh, and we'll discuss all the like when we get to viruses and stuff. We'll, talk, we'll discuss all those type of proteins and 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 the like. Like it's actually really interesting stuff if you're into it. Hormones are chemical signaling molecules, usually small proteins or steroids, secreted by endocrine cells to act or to control or regulate specific physiological processes, including growth, development, metabolism, and reproduction. Uh, yeah, like, you hear, you hear things like hormones and stuff, like when you're, uh, well, you hear that stuff a lot, and hormones are simply signaling, like, uh, if you have a hormonal problem, it means that certain things won't function simply because the body doesn't need, know it functions. Hormones are similar to like message, messenger boys. If something needs to be done, it goes to another part of the body that needs its help and basically tells it. So that's why hormones, just like with steroids and enzymes, hormones are vital in your, in your bodily functions. And here is a short list of the protein types and function. There's a number of these. So if you guys want to look through these, you uh, be my guest. I want to get on so we can focus on the other stuff that are important. But this is a great list. If you need something like this, you can probably find some a list like this on uh, Google they can print out. It would be very wise to uh, to um, uh, study all these if you if you're in if you're like taking biology and whatnot. Hopefully later in the book it will give us a little more uh, detail into all of these as I 
in my studies, we have to remember every single one. We just have to remember that these, if I see a list like this, these are proteins. And of course, we have some important ones such as hemoglobin, uh, insulin, um, actin, egg, apparently, egg white, who knew? Um, but yeah, these are, these are rather important. For instance, hemoglobin transports its oxygen through the body, and I know insulin takes care of the, uh, uh, basically regulate your, the sugar intake and output. Now we're here to the... Uh, well, actually, let's read this first, because it's in bold. Uh, proteins have different shapes and molecule, molecular weights. Some proteins are glo globular in shape, whereas others are fibrous in nature. For example, hemoglobin is a globular protein. In other words, it's a, it's a sphere. But collagen, located in the skin, is a fibrous protein because it has to keep the skin together. Protein shape is critical to its fu function, and many different types of chemical bonds maintain this shape. Changes in temperature, pH, and exposure to chemicals may lead to permanent changes in the protein shape, leading to a loss of function, or denaturization. I'm not entirely sure exactly how that happens, but apparently that's not fun. I believe radiation ha does a lot. A part of the reason why radiation is so dangerous is because it denaturizes your proteins. But now let's talk about the amino acid which are the monomers that comprise proteins. Each amino acid has the same functional, fundamental structure, which consists of centralized carbon atoms, or, or the alpha carbon, bonded to an amino group, NH2, in other words, a carboxyl group, COOH, and a hydrogen atom. Each amino acid also has another atom or group of atoms bonded together to the center atom known as the R group. So basically that means, I think we'll see here, yeah, here we go, okay. Yeah. Alright, here is the uh, thing. What that basically was telling you is that every single, every single amino acid has all of this. It has the amino group, which is the double, which is the NH2. Well, then it will connect to the the central atom and a an hydrogen atom. It has to have a hydrogen atom or this will be unstable. And then you have the carboxyl group, which is your which is your C C O H C O O H. This just means a double bond, which I believe we went over uh, a few videos ago when we were talking about chemistry. Now, what makes each one unique is the R group. And the R group could be several different structures. Like the R group could be like I'm just saying I don't remember all of these, but like N H O O C O O H or something like that. Like each one is different. Each one has different function, and I'm sure we'll have some examples later on. But that's basically what that means. The R group is what identifies each amino acid. So when we say R group, it means all this is the same, but this is what makes it different. So if you're ever confused, that's, the R group is simply the, if you will, identity tag of the particular um, uh, amino acid is what makes it different. Alright. Oh, and uh, here, like I said, here we go. Uh, for instance, as you can see here, each one is the same. Now, I know it's a little different here than what we saw, but generally, like here you see the H is on top and this is on the side, but here you have this on top and this on the side. doesn't really matter because um, I don't, I forgot what the term is. Um, I In chemistry, we call it re resonance, I believe, and I don't think that amino acids are re resonant, so the order here doesn't really matter. But as you can see, here are the R groups in blue, if you can, I believe it's in color, but in blue. Uh, as you can see, in every single one, the, uh, the structure is the same. You have the NH3. Here it's NH3 because very often the, the uh, um, what's it called, nitrogen atom will have an extra pair that has to be bonded. So while technically only need the, the two H's, very often you'll get the third H because here it's not double bonded. And N, if you take chemistry, has to have four bonds. Or generally does have four bonds. So, well, generally, they, they want three, but generally they have four if they can get that complete uh, octet. So, that's why it says NH3 here. Then, of course, here's your COO minus. Generally, COOH, because that hydrogen is going over here. And then here's your H. So you see the basic structure. The book's kind of weird. I'm not sure why I didn't explain that here because it's like if you don't take chemistry, this is not going to make any sense as to why it changes. But that's what's going on. It's nothing that complicated. It's just that if you if you're into chemistry, you know that the H will sometimes move 
now sometimes will move to lesser density so it can fill that up and it's less dense over here like electron wise but as you can plainly see the structure is basically the same the same number of atoms as up here in fact i'll prove it to you we have two o's two c's four h's one n i see two o's two c's one two three four four h's and one n same stuff just rearranged but here are your um identity tags for your R groups. Here's glycine, and here's al alanine. They're kind of the same, but what's different? It's the tag. Glycine is when it has just an H in the R group, and alanine is when it has H CH3 in the R group. Valine is different when it has CH connected to a two CH3s. So that's basically what that's going on here. What's going on here is these are what's called carbon rings. Every single one of these are carbon slash hydrogen bonds. In other words, right here, this little point, is a carbon bond that generally has three hydrogens, three or four, sorry, two or three hydrogens depending on what kind of bond it has. This carbon will have two hydrogen because it has, it's double bond to another carbon. So each one of these points is a carbon atom. So this here, phenylalanine, I'm not sure, forgive me if I pronounced that wrong, has a C, the R group is going to be CH2 connected to a C, which is going to be connected to another C. This C is going to have two H's. This C is going to have two H's because it has to have four bonds. So it's going to have one, two, three, four. And this, the double line means double connect to a carbon. Actually, no, it's going to have one. Two, no, it's going to have one H because it's going to be connect to a carbon. Then double connect to another carbon means it only has one more. It's going to, it's going to have one more um, bond. It's going to be the H. So each one of these has one H, it looks like. But this is not that complicated, it just means that each point is a C and H, is a, is a C connected to other H's depending on how many bonds it has. So, when I was studying chemistry, this ring scared me because I thought it was a little so confusing, but honestly it's not that bad. The chemical nature of the side chain determines the amino acid's nature, that is whether it is acidic, basic, polar, or nonpolar. For example, the amino acid glycine has a hydrogen atom as the R group. Amino acids such as valine, metha methionine, and alanine are nonpolar or hydrophobic in nature. In other words, they don't like water. While amino acids such as serine, theorine, and cysteine, I guess, that's hard to pronounce, are polar and have hydrophilic side chains. In other words, they dissolve in water. A single uppercase letter or a three letter abbreviation represents the amino acid. For example, for example the letter V or the three letter symbol VAL represents valine. Because you don't want to have to write "-ene", every time, because "-ene", the suffix "-ene", simply means it's an amino acid. The sequence and a number of amino acids ultimately determine the protein's shape, size, and function. A covalent bond, or peptide bond, attaches to each uh, amino acid, which a, dehyd a dehydration reaction forms. And I believe we went over that a few videos ago. Dehydration basically means it replaces the- it removes the water at the end of a- it removes the water at the end of a macromolecule molecule and attaches itself. Another chain attaches itself to that chain by removing the water. And a hydrogen and a hydro, I believe it's called a hydra, hydration reaction is when the thing is removed and water replaces it. The resulting bond is a peptide bond, and technically that is the uh, that is the polymer of um, proteins, peptide bonds. Uh, each amino acid, when they're connected, forms a peptide bond, and then, like, I believe we talk about polypeptide bonds, and that makes the protein. So while I think I read that technically the, the polymer is the protein, I would say really the polymer is the peptide, or polypeptide, and the actual macromolecule is the, the final product macromolecule is the protein. So that's just how I, how I envision it. And here's a peptide bond. These two are individuals. You see, it when it connects, it removes this water so these two can connect. That's why it's called dehydra dehydra dehydration connection, because when these two connect, it will create water. But then the water is removed so these two, so these two, the C and the N, can connect. And then if they were to break apart, it would be a hydration, well, it's not hydration bond, it's a hydration like, I can't remember what we said, hydration like fizz or something like that, where the water will come in, break these two apart, and then OH will go into one, H will go into the other, uh, the reason OH is going here is because 
Oh man, I remember my chemistry. I believe the H is going to here. Oh, it's going to here because of the certain structure with the H here. But that's why, because if we have too many electrons, it will go to the end. All right. Uh, okay. Protein structure. Here we go. As we discussed earlier, a protein shape is critical to its function. For example, an enzyme can bind to a specific substrate at an active site. If this active site is altered because of local changes or changes in overall protein structure, the enzyme may be unable to bind to the substrate. To understand how the protein gets its final shape or conformation, conformation we need to understand the four levels of protein structure. Primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. This kind of threw me, up, this kind of threw me off when I was taking it, but... Once we get into it, it's really not that hard to understand. It's really not that complicated. It just seems complicated through the photos. By the way, we're going to see this a lot when we get into enzymes. Active site is basically an area that an enzyme can get into and affect things. That's basically what that means. Alright, so first we have your primary structure. Amino acid's unique sequence in a polypeptide chain is its primary structure. For example, the pancreatic hormone insulin has two polypeptide chains, A and B, and they are linked together by... Dis disulfide bonds. Not sure exactly what that is. The N-terminal amino acid of the A chain is glycine, whereas the C-terminal amino acid is asparagine. The amino acid sequence in the A and B chains are unique to insulin. And as you can see here, these two are connected here and here. That, 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 this is the primary structure. Basically, the primary structure is how each amino, how each polypeptide is connected in the protein. That's essentially what the primary structure is. The gene encoding of a protein ultimately determines the unique sequence for every protein, and we that's basically that's basically you know how how many R groups there are in each uh, peptide and how they're all connected. That's essentially what that is like right here. In it, like the the molecule therefore has about 600 amino acids, the structure difference between a normal hemoglobin molecule and a sickle cell molecule, which dramatically decreases life expectancy, is a single amino acid of the 600. Yes, if you change one amino acid, it really affects everything. Uh, you, um, our, uh, chemist, our body chemistry is such a delicate balance, it's actually quite amazing we're able to function the way we do. Like for instance, right here it shows, in, in, in your, if you do not have sickle cell, most people don't, but a lot do, if you don't have sickle cell, this is what your um, amino acid structure for your blood looks like. In your hemoglobin, I mean. Everything is the same except one R group and one uh, of one of the 600 amino acids. This is what it normally looks like, but if you have um, uh, sickle cell, this is what it looks like. It doesn't look that different, but this can really change things. And I don't want to go too much into it because it's chemistry, but the reason this changes a lot of things is the shape of uh, the molecule. Very often, the molecules will bend depending on what's more like negative. Like for instance, if you see water, you will see it bend like the O's here, and they will bend because electro, because the hydrogen, uh, the hydrogen um, electronegativity is being pushed away from the oxygen because of the uh, um, electronic negativity difference. Here's the same way. In this, it looks like it will not really bend that much, but here it's going to bend. It no, no, I got reversed. This is going to bend a lot where it can, where here because of the O is going to bend a lot. Where you can see it will create kind of a circular shape. But here, it's not going to bend at all, it's going to be rigid and straight, which you usually see it being more of a spike or sickle. So here, the big, the big reason is because of the shape difference. That's why, that, that, that's why, like, they say that chemistry, uh, biology is basically applied chemistry, and physics is applied chem, and ch chemistry is applied physics. So here, it's really just a physics problem. This is straight, so it's going to scrape on you a lot. Now we have the secondary structure. The primary structure is essentially the basic, uh, the the basic structure of each peptide connecting to each other peptide, making the polypeptide, uh, um, making the polypeptide strings. So in other words, the the um, the the uh, primary structure is this thing. Of course, the secondary structure is going to essentially be a lot of these things. The local, the local folding of the polypeptide in some region gives rise to the secondary structure of the proteins. The most common are the A alpha helix and the beta pleated pl pl sheet structures. Both structures are held in shape by hydrogen bonds. Basically means hydrogen connecting to other hydrogen or oxygen. I mean, sorry, uh, other hydrogen. Actually, basically, hydrogen bond is basically anything connected to hydrogen. And they're separated because of how different hydrogen is. The hydrogen bonds formed between the oxygen atoms in the carboxyl group in one amino acid and another amino acid 
that is for amino acids further along the chain. So as you can see here, basically, primary is the basic structure of each chain. Secondary is, ba is the basic structure when all the chains are combined. As you can see, when you combine all those chains, you will get this. Now, I'm not sure which this is exactly, but we obtain this hemoglobin from it, and once you've combined all of the ones here, you'll get this basic shape. Again, I don't know that this is exactly hemoglobin, but you can get the idea. Primary is the basic shape of each chain. The secondary is when all the chains are combined. Tertiary structure. The polypeptide unique three-dimensional structure is the tertiary structure. This structure is in part due to chemical interactions that at work in the polypeptide chain. Basically, when more chains are, when more secondary structure chains are combined, you get the overall 3D shape. Like, this is kind of a 2D shape because, like, this is a really small part of the whole protein. So this is kind of a 2D shape. While we combine all of these, you will get something like this. And you can see the bonding together. And here's the polypeptide backbone. Basically, uh, the, the carboxyl groups, the amino acids, etc the amino groups, etc., etc. This structure, okay, I read that. Primarily, the interaction among R groups creates the protein's complex three-dimensional tertiary structure, and that makes sense as we discussed in the secondary structure. The nature of the R groups and the amino acids involved can counteract forming the hydrogen bonds we described for standard secondary structures. For example, R groups with like charges, with like charges repel each other, and those with unlike charges are attracted to each other which form ionic bonds. If you, and if you recall from the chemistry part, ionic, ionic bonds is when uh, a negative atom still takes an electron from a positive atom, but a positive atom sticks around because of the attraction it has to the, uh, to the negative uh, atom. Make uh, relationship jokes as you will in the comments. And now we get to the quater quaternary structure. In nature, some proteins form from several polypeptides or subunits, and the interaction of these subunits form the quaternary structure, which essentially is the protein itself. Like, for instance, insulin is the final quaternary structure. Uh, hemoglobin is the final quaternary structure. So all of these will make the hemoglobin, but the, the quaternary structure is the hemoglobin. I guess in a way you could say, like, the cell, in a human, the cell is the primary structure, the... Um, the tissue would be the secondary structure, like you have the cells, the cells combine to make the tissue, like heart tissue, skin tissue. The tertiary structure would be like your organs, your skin, your heart, and the quaternary structure would be you. You are the quaternary structure. That's probably the best way to look at it. And here it is right here. In fact, here's a pride going. Primary structure, the in individual chains combined. Secondary structure, these things combine to make this, it, you can kind of see, like, it's not a great picture because it's in 2D, but if you look, like, the way these bend, like, this fold would be one of these, this fold would be another one, blah, 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 blah. The ter tertiary structure would be a bunch of these combined, you can kind of see that here. In fact, you kind of look, like, it looks like these little lines are these, and then this folding here is these, and then quaternary structure, which is the actual protein itself. Alright, what do we got? Now we're going to talk about briefly, looks like we're talking briefly about de denaturing and protein folding. Each protein has its own unique sequence and shape that chemical interactions hold together. If the protein is subject to changes in temperature, pH, or exposure to chemicals, such as radiation, the protein structure may change, losing its shape without losing its primary sequence in what scientists call denaturization. Denaturization is often reversible because the polypeptide's primary structure is conserved in the process if the denaturing agent is removed, allowing the protein to resume its function. Sometimes denaturing is irreversible, leading to loss of function. One example of irreversible protein denaturization is frying an egg. The, the al albumin, albumin, albumin protein in, in the liquid egg white denatures when placed in a hot pan. Not all proteins denature at high temperatures. For instance, bacteria that survive in hot springs have proteins that function at temperatures close to boiling. The stomach is also very acidic, has a low pH, and denatures uh, proteins as part of the digestion process. And remember, low pH means very acidic, high pH means very basic, not very acidic. However, the stomach's digestive enzymes retain their acti activity under these conditions. Protein folding is critical to its function. Scientists originally thought that the proteins themselves were, reverse, were responsible for the folding process. Only recently, researchers discovered that often they receive assistance in the folding process from protein helpers, or chaperones. 
Really? Well, that's what I called. They associate with a target protein during the folding process. They act by preventing polypeptides aggregation that compromise that com that comprise the complete protein structure, and they disassociate from the protein once target protein is folded. All right, looks like that is the end for our session today. The next session we will be doing is the nucleic acid, which is the fifth and final, um, sorry, fourth and final uh, ma macromolecule. And that's going to comprise, as you can see, of DNA and RNA. And that's all for today. So please let me know down in the comments if there's anything I can change. Like, is what I'm saying makes making sense? And do you like where the where where the uh, face cam cam is? I try to keep, keep it out of the way of the actual book. And I try to keep my reading down lower on the screen so you guys can see. So, that's all I have to say for today. So, thank you all very much for watching. Have a wonderful day. I hope you learned of what you came to learn. And God bless.